Well, for those of you who have been astute <laughs> as you've gone through worship with us this morning, you'll see that this morning I want to talk to you about Pentecost with a Pentecost alliteration. And I hope that this alliteration will help remind you in the days to come of the importance of Pentecost. It's a few years ago that Dr. John Huffman was preaching at a uh, conference, and he pointed out that if you go through the beginning of the book of Acts, that there is an alliteration there for Pentecost, the promise of Pentecost, the posture of Pentecost, the picture of Pentecost, the preaching of Pentecost, and the practice of Pentecost. And the promise of Pentecost was found there at the beginning of worship in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When I began uh, my seminary studies at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, one of my first assignments was to discover how many things we can learn from Acts 1 through 8. I went home the first night, I found 25 things, and I came back and the professor wasn't happy with that, nor with the rest of the class, he said she could find more. Then we found 25 more, came back to class very pleased with ourselves, he says you need to find more, so we found 25 more, and 25 more after that, and then 100 more after that, and 100 more after that, and by the time we were done with that class, 350 things from Acts 1 through 8. So I thought I'd share all 350 with you. No, 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 no. Just a few. Notice the word you there, but you. Now in English, we don't know. Is that singular or is that plural? You cannot tell. But if you go back to the Greek in which this was written, you can tell it's plural. And so the promise is for many. We'll receive, you know, that's future tense. You will have to wait for this. But in the end, the promise will be given. Now, the promise insinuates that power is the result of what is given. And what is the promised gift that is given? It is the Holy Spirit given to you, the many, to you and to me. And the result will be that you will be my witnesses. Now, the my, which is possessive, refers to one who is speaking. Who, and who is speaking in this case? It's Jesus. And so we might ask, how are we to be witnesses? Well, possessive. Maybe we're witnesses simply by belonging to Jesus. Or maybe we are to witness of Jesus. Or maybe we are to witness about Jesus. Maybe we are to witness for Jesus. See, the promise of Pentecost can be quite straightforward, and yet it entails so much. Jesus gave the promise amidst the last word that he spoke to his disciples while he was on this earth. And so often we say that the last words, say of a dying person, have so much truth, so much significance, so much meaning. Or maybe when you say goodbye to someone, as you send them off to war, send them off to school, the last words spoken are so significant and important. These were Jesus' last words before his ascension, given to his disciples right then and there, but are applicable to Jesus' disciples even in the here and now, you and me. The promise of Pentecost for all of us. Second, there's the posture of Pentecost in receiving God's promise. The biblical record tells us that there is a proper posture for the people who are to receive this promise. The first aspect of Pentecost posturing is to be ready. Are you ready? Now those of you who know me well know that as I was growing up that one of the things that I enjoyed doing so very much was playing baseball. And I will tell you that there is a proper posture in catching a baseball. If Bill Benz were to throw me an autographed St. Louis Cardinals baseball, and I were to stand here like this, and he threw the ball at me, it would not be the proper posture. Boing! The proper posture is to give Bill a target and to have him throw the ball to me with this hand ready 
the, you know, with the glove catching it than to catch the ball. If I were playing in the outfield, the proper posture would be for me to get back behind the fly ball, to run up on the ball, to catch it, reach into my glove with one hand, and in one fluid motion, throw that ball to whatever base I was to throw it to. There's a proper posture in catching a baseball. There's a proper posture in hitting a baseball. You don't just get into the batter's box and stand there like this. You get ready. You get that elbow up. You have the proper posture to hit the baseball. This morning, I don't know if you have the proper posture in catching and hitting. I'm simply asking you, do you have the proper posture in spiritual matters? Acts 1.14 tells us that the first disciples had the proper Pentecost posturing. The text says that they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And as it goes to Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. There is no substitute, you see, for Christian community. And that's why the church exists. It's a necessity, my friends, to create Christian community. Community. So just like a coach taught me the proper catching and hitting posture, the church, the ch Christian community is where we discover the proper posture of a people who are open to receive the fullness of the power of God's Spirit and to continue to receive the fullness of that power in the days to come. This posture has at least four aspects. One aspect is that of being together in one place. You can't go it alone in the Christian life. You need your brothers and sisters in Christ to assist you along the way. So many people who claim spirituality, they want a lone ranger posture. But that's not the best posture. We need to be in Christian community. A second aspect is the necessity of being in the spirit of prayer. We need times alone in prayer, yes. But we also need times in prayer with one another. We did that during the season of Lent. And this summer, with those of you who remain with us here in Sun City West, we want to get in that proper spiritual posture as well again. Robin McFarlane is here today. She's right over here. We encourage you this summer to join with two other people in a posture of prayer, reading a some from the Word of God each day, writing down your thoughts, then getting together once a week or once every other week with two other people, share what you read in the Word of God and how it spoke to you, share prayer concerns, and pray for one another. I encourage you wholeheartedly this morning, see Robin, get a card, sign up. We want prayer triads happening throughout the church this summer. A third aspect is to be taking seriously what the Scriptures have to say. I'm fascinated at the fact that during these days between the ascension of Jesus and Pentecost, that 120 close followers of Jesus heard the scriptures taught. Peter expounded the Old Testament teachings to them. It's a posture of receptivity to God's teaching. It happens in worship as it's happening right now. It happened last week during adult Bible school. It happens at the various Bible studies offered here at Desert Palms. In fact, tomorrow morning, you can join us in the conference room, each and every one of you at 1030, to study seriously the Word of God. And if we fill up that room, we'll move in here. You're all invited to come and be a part. You know, spiritual maturation means biblical application. We must know what the Bible teaches, and then we must live it. And a fourth aspect is that they were waiting expectantly for God to act. Is there that dimension of waiting in your life? I know in my life I've experienced it over the years. I can go all the way back to when Kathy and I were not as of yet married. Kathy was spending her last year at Grove City College, her senior year. I was at Gordon-Conwell. She was in Pennsylvania. I was in Massachusetts. This was before email, before Skype. All we could do was call one another or write ourselves notes, letters. I waited a full year. 
to marry the most wonderful woman on the face of the earth. But after we were married, you know, Kathy got sick, primary sclerosing cholangitis, and it was destroying her liver. And we waited another decade for the answer to our prayers where God gave Kathy a new liver. And then, for the past five years, we were waiting for one son to graduate. <laughs> we still have another son to graduate. And yet the gift is going to come. God asks us, often to wait for the good gifts that he has for us. So is your, yours a posture of being together on a regular basis with believers in Christ? Is yours a posture of prayer? Is yours a posture of having the Bible open before you in personal daily meditation as well as in worship and Bible study? Is yours a posture of waiting upon God, trusting him in his time to fulfill his promises, it should be. And that, my friends, is the posture of Pentecost. And then there's the picture of Pentecost. Luke describes how there were staying in Jerusalem some God-fearing Jews from every nation who heard the sound of a mighty violent wind and they gathered together in bewilderment, each hearing disciples speaking in their own language. Some, deeply perplexed, wanted to know, hey, what does this mean? Others made fun of the disciples, declaring, hey, they've had too much wine to drink. It's interesting, the Hebrew word for spirit and the Hebrew word for wind are actually the same word, the ruach. The wind had been an emblem of the spirit for the Hebrew people since the beginning of time. You know the spirit, the wind? It says in the in the book of Genesis, it was present the day of creation. We can go to the pro prophetic times, to the prophet Ezekiel, who said that that wind, the spirit, was in that valley of dry bones in which a dejected, defeated people would be brought back to life. Jesus used the image of that wind and spirit when he was describing to Nicodemus what it means to be born again. And now, here on this day of Pentecost in the upper room, this violent wind, the presence of the Spirit was blowing, rushing with an irresistible force. What I want you to notice about each and every one of these instances is that the wind represented something new. New energy, new life, new vitality, new thought, new creativity, new emotion. It came to life by this infilling of the Holy Spirit, God was bringing to life his people both individually and corporately. Yes, corporately. He was birthing the church that day. And not only was wind part of the picture, some of you will recall that there was also the tongues of fire. The text says they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. The fire of the Holy Spirit, you see, it purges us. It burns away the chaff all that debilitates us and prevents you and me from becoming what God created you and me to become. And not only is the chaff burned away, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, it says that it refines us, as does the melting process that burns off the dross, bringing out the pure metal. The Bible talks about the refiner's fire that purges us, that enables us to live with the warmth of God's Spirit emanating from our lives. This fire of the Holy Spirit helps us to love others appropriately, to be a people who are more giving, who clothes ourselves with the attributes of Jesus Christ so we can be more consistent in our Christian living and more forgiving of others. There's a third picture here. It's that of speaking in tongues. Some would distinguish between tongues being the kind of ecstatic utterance that is not really an, an intelligible language, except when it is interpreted by someone who has the gift of understanding that otherwise unintelligible language. But there's a second understanding of tongues. It's literally the capacity to communicate with people in ways that go beyond human understanding. I mean, gathered in Jerusalem that day were men and women 
from many different nations speaking many different languages. And here were these Galileans, and not so sophisticated, really, but they were able to convey the gospel of Jesus Christ in ways that were intelligible and understandable to people who are not like them. How can I get across the picture of Pentecost? I mean, how does the wind, the fire, the tongues apply to us today? And the best way to summarize is trying to paint a picture of those times in life when a person outdoes herself or himself. Take a young football player who in the last two minutes of the game, his team is losing by just a little less than a touchdown. But he's handed the football. He's running towards the end zone. He's running faster than he's ever run before. His legs are carrying him in an amazing way. He outdoes himself scoring the winning touchdown. And when he comes out of the game, the coach says to him, I didn't know you had it in you. And if he's honest, he would reply, I didn't either. I was picked up and carried by something outside of myself. That's the picture of what happens to you and me when we are open to the fullness and the power of the Holy Spirit, allowing his wind to propel us, his fire to purify us, and his endowment of communication capabilities to help us convey the objectivity of his truth and our experience of our relationship with him to other people. I want to also look this morning at the preaching of Pentecost. That day, the guest speaker was uh, Peter. He was in the pulpit. We hear a lot of talk today that when you give a message, that you need to stay on message. It's important that we, as followers of Jesus, have a Pentecostal power that enables us to stay on message, as Peter did that day. All good preaching, you see, needs to to be built on a firm foundation, and that firm foundation is the Scriptures. Peter didn't have the New Testament like I had this morning as I preach on Acts. He went back to the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. Peter is using this passage. And what does he do next? He explains the meaning and the significance of the facts which were coming from Joel's words. The next element of Peter's preaching was exhortation. You see that word? And this is Peter's call to women and men of the duties and obligations which are the natural result of following God's word. And finally, Peter answers the so what question. How should the word that he shared from Joel impact the lives of those who are gathered on that first Pentecost? And what Peter is doing here is setting the tone for preaching, even in our own day. Every church, if it's faithful to Jesus Christ in the scriptures, has in its life these elements of preaching and teaching. In fact, I personally believe that every sermon, even though it may be concentrating in one area in particular, should have a little bit of these four elements that Peter includes in his Pentecost sermon. In Acts 2, 14 to 41, there you'll find his sermon. Preach that first Pentecost. Kind of like a Billy Graham sermon where he's standing up and preaching on the theme of the four steps of peace with God. Peter gets up and he addresses the crowd, declaring that these men and women, they're not drunk. They're filled with Holy Spirit power and energy. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. I mean, what's happening before your eyes, he says, is the fulfillment of what the prophet Joel and others predicted would happen. And then he zeroes in on the person and work of Jesus Christ. This kind of preaching begs a response. And some of the people who heard Peter that day were, according to Luke, cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, those who were there that day, for your children, and for all who are far off, for you and for me. Peter continued to preach, warning them of the corruptness of their generation. And what was the result of this preaching? Ruth writes, those who accepted the message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. 
And finally, let's look at the practice of Pentecost. Luke shows us four specific practices of a living, Holy Spirit-filled church in Acts 2, 42 to 47. Four practices stand out. One, it was a learning church. There were at least 3,120 people that day devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They took learning seriously, just like we took learning seriously at adult Bible school last week. This wasn't simply a mystical experience that caused them to neglect theology. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is not anti-intellectualism. Today we have the prophetic teachings of the Old Testament, which the early church had, which Peter used that day, but we also have the apostles' teaching as recorded and preserved for us by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. A spirit-filled church is a biblical church committed to the Word of God. That's why I invite you tomorrow to come, 1030, to that Bible study in the conference room. Practice number two, it was a caring church. They were involved in the practice of fellowship. They came together in intimate groupings. They saw everything that they had was actually God's gift to them to be used in serving one another. And so they shared with each other all is common, whatever they had. Third, it was a worshiping church. These early believers met together regularly to break bread and pray together. Their worship was formed formal in the temple. And their worship was informal also in their homes. They gathered for little home Bible studies or prayer triads. And fourth, it was an evangelizing church. The teaching that nourished the believers was balanced by a continuing emphasis on calling people to repentance and faith. And when they did these four things, what happened? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved evangelism. That's central to our work. You and I are called to share our faith both individually and corporately. Again, what are the four specific practices of a living, Holy Spirit-filled church? A desire to learn, a willingness to care, a spirit of worship, and a responsibility to tell others about Christ and invite them to church. Let me conclude with the same question which I opened the service this morning. If we had to forgo the celebration of Christmas, Good Friday, Easter, or Pentecost, which one would seem least crucial? And as, as essential as is Christmas, as is Good Friday, as is Easter, these three would not be celebrated at all if it were not for Pentecost. So just as in incarnation God came in human form, and in crucifixion God died for the sins of the world, and in resurrection, God triumphed over sin and death. Even so, in Pentecost, God empowers you and me and his church universal to live out his glory and to do his work until he comes again. I invite you now to join me in prayer. And as we do, I would like to pray a phrase, and I invite you to pray it immediately following Pray with me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me. Melt me. Mold me. Fill me. Use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Empowering me to be. Empowering me to do. All you dream of me being and doing. All you dream of me being and doing.